Welcome, Stan. Thank you for having me. This is, this is wild. <laughs> this is so great. I'm so delighted that Slush enabled me to convince Stan to leave the Bay Area and join us here in Helsinki uh, on stage to chat about um, the journey of yeah. being the co-founder of Discord. Uh, how many of you folks in the audience use Discord just before we start? Are familiar oh, with Discord? It's quite a bit of people in the audience. Pretty good, pretty good. <laughs> I, I, it was also kind of cool yesterday. I, I, I was tweeted at, are you still allowed to say that? Um, that someone, whoever's operating the, the lasers is like sitting on Discord at the same time. It was kind of cool. All so. right. No wonder it's doing so well. <laughs> um, well, cool. So, really happy to have you. I think one of the most interesting aspects to talk about, I mean, Discord today has 150 million active users on a monthly basis. Um, it has 900 folks working there. Uh, I think 75% plus of the folks are overseas who use Discord. Yeah. Um, it was a journey to get to Discord. Yeah. So it would be great to start off with how you became co-founder of Discord, how this all came about. Yeah, it's kind of a wild journey. Like uh, some of you may not know this, but Discord um, or, like, is a culmination of pivots, <laughs> to be honest. Yeah. And originally, Discord came out of a company called Hammer and Chisel, which was actually originally founded by my co-founder um, uh, Jason. And it was originally set up as like a, right when the iPad came out, and the, the thesis was like, how do we connect more people around games, and like, how do we bring like PC quality games to the iPad? And it was it was. Uh, and uh, I was introduced to Jason through like a, a mutual friend, and they showed me what they were working on, and it was kind of really impressive what they got done on an iPad with a very tiny team. And uh, I just joined that company because it was kind of similar to my mission, like uh, playing games with people and connecting. It's like really core to my li uh, life and like how I grew up. And I've always been trying to make that easier for people, so I joined. Uh, the game was extremely fun to work on, and like all the challenges of getting all that working on uh, on an iPad. When you joined Hammer and Chisel, did you think that the iPad was a very good platform for gaming, or was it more the challenge that yeah, I'll that be you honest, were into? I was skeptical, but the team was really cool and it was really impressive. And yeah. like the mission is really is what really when people joining early, you care more about the mission than the individuals and the exact thing because it's a windy road to success, right? right? Um, but, but yeah, like the, we worked on the game. It was a critical success, but a commercial failure of making hit games is hard. Yeah. And the company's thesis was um, build this really successful game that has really social and, and then take that social layer and like use it to build more games and distribute more games. And um, Sorry, Stan. Yeah. I'm not going to let you go just, uh, just yet. So you said it was a critical, it critically acclaimed, yeah. but not a success. Why wasn't it a success? What, what were the reasons that you think it, it failed from a commercial standpoint? Yeah, I mean, there's probably a lot of reasons. One, it was an iPad game, not an iPhone game. Yeah. Um, but I think it was also like ahead of its time on some level. Uh, today, you see similar games. Like the game was originally like a MOBA, kind of like League of Legends for uh, for iPad. Yeah. Um, you've seen since some of those games be successful, but really they started being successful more like like in 2018 as uh, more like more uh, kind of hardcore games became more viable on on mobile. So maybe we we're just ahead of our time. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so doesn't help. Timing, you know, timing is so helpful that yeah. you just got to nail that. Okay, sorry for the interruption. Please carry on. Yeah, yeah. So the thesis was we could, we could do this and build a social layer. And uh, as we were trying to figure out what to do next, like different types of games or what else, um, I like kind of took that moment. I'm gonna be honest, like, to just, like shoot my shot basically, because like I've been really obsessed with building social products for people who play games and connecting them. And I kind of went to J Jason and I kind of pitched him on like, hey, we could probably skip building this game because if the thing is like build like a social platform that for people who play games, there, I, like, there's, there's an opportunity uh, here. Um, but there's a catch. <laughs> I was like, it, it's 2015, it's probably gonna be desktop first to start. And um, like, it was kind of like, uh, it was kind of like what, what are you saying in 2015? <laughs> Everything is mobile. Yeah. Um, but like the, the reality is like, like as someone who used these products for a long time myself, I, it was like really clear like there was like a, something missing. The products haven't really been updated in tw like almost 15 years. Like no one's really making them better. Like you have to go and like people were like having to go and like rent like servers and sharing IP addresses. Right. And this art was just inaccessible. This type of hanging out was just inaccessible and organizing. And then people were like sharing their SMS numbers with people online and like 
in 2015, that felt unacceptable. And the other observation was like WebRTC at the time was uh, really taking its stride and becoming viable to build on top of. And I was like, and you, you could just make it work everywhere. You can make it one click in a browser. Like that would be magical. Like it's like it was this unique opportunity to effectively disrupt a very saturated market just by actually being able to 10x to 10x and make this really co like a cohesive, beautiful experience. Um, so yeah, and I mean, talking to Jason and talking to you, a lot of the youth fun parts developing the best yeah. relationships that you had were online playing games. Yeah. So the the social component of gameplay around it yeah. wasn't that wasn't that different from the actual playing of the game. It was totally yeah. integrated. Y yeah, I mean because like people play games to like a lot of people just do like some just to, to unwind, but a lot to build relationships. Like, I, I, I grew up in LA, in, like, in Los Angeles, in, like the, in the valley, far away from all my friends, and like, getting online very young, like, getting on IRC, getting on like, all, yeah. like, MMORPGs, was just a way to connect with people that I couldn't, and that like, really built like, really long-term relationships for me. Some of those people literally work at Discord today, just that I met like, 25 years ago on these online games. Like making that easier for everyone because it's just the place to hang out and games are just a vehicle for that. So. And how was it pitching Jason that this should be a radically different <laughs> pivot? Yeah. Well, the beauty was it was still aligned to the mission. It was like the same connecting people through games. Yeah. You could still potentially distribute. Uh, that didn't really work out with us <laughs> later, so that, that's like a different pivot. But Yes, um, we'll get to that. <laughs> we, yeah, we'll, we can get to that. But at the end of the day, like, the, the real tricky part was Okay, it, like he had to go and like do his own research to really validate what I was kind of telling him. But the tricky part was like it's desktop, and like we had to convince ourselves like how we'd also work on mobile, and like to really honestly even tell the board this is what we want to do. But luckily the board invested in the people, not the idea, because like there's so many pivots along the way. Um, but he did come back like after a couple of days, I think of researching. He's like, this just feels like if you ask yourself. This, does this need to exist? Like it feels like it has to exist, and he's like, "Okay, just go start working on it." Uh, so cool. And so we're to, we were hearing from Ricardo Zacconi earlier, who was talking about how essentially, at, before it was King, it was Midas Player. They basically divvied up the team. Part of the team was doing the sort of tactical stuff to stay yeah. alive, and then there were all these SWAT teams working on on new ventures, which yeah. ended up being Candy Crush. Is that akin to what happened, or you weren't in that position? Like you needed to a radical pivot, no matter what. Yeah, we needed a radical pivot, but um, we it was hard to make that decision. We were a company making games. We had employees dedicated right. to the craft of making games. Yeah. And uh, I, I think that at first the company tried to do two things at once. And when mm -hmm. you're a startup, you, you, you kind of don't want, and you haven't found what you were going to be successful at. You, you kind of don't want to do that with limited resources. So we were like working on a new iPhone game this time. Uh -huh. And at the same time, like there was like me and, a co and our designer and a couple others working on what would become Discord. Okay. But we were slowly siphoning people. I, eventually, I siphoned Jason onto the Discord project because he's also an engineer. <laughs> and then Jason, was, uh, Jason like rightfully like made the tough call. He's like. This feels like it's going to work. I want to just kind of bet on it. And he pivoted the company to Discord. Cool. Yeah. And were all the developers on board? Be uh, because some of them, you know, <laughs> at least in my experience, are pretty dedicated. Like, I want to be in, in gaming. I want to develop games. If yeah. I wanted to develop a communication platform, I'd probably not be joining. Yeah, yeah. Well, l uh, luckily, I don't think like no one was like, I wouldn't work on this. Yeah. But just with any time when you try to like make a drastic change, people were like very, very like, like, is this really going to work? Does the world really need this? Like, uh, like one of our employees who's still with us today, who famously like kept his Ventrilo server, the old product, running for a year after we launched Discord. He's like, no one's going to switch to this, and he was doing amazing work on the product. But he he was just very contrarian. That's uh, so. Um, That's amazing. And by the way, in terms of timing of Slack, yeah. you know, because obviously. Slack also was a yeah. radical pivot to yeah. a communications yeah. platform. Did you think of that at all? Did, were you folks aware of that? So 
the, the thing that's probably lesser known is like, I, like before I ever pitched this to Jason, like a year prior is when I made the first prototype of what would become Discord on the side. Okay. And it was before Slack existed. It was actually inspired by a product called FlowDoc, if anyone ever remembers that. Uh, and I was like, I don't. <laughs> it was it was pre Slack, and now. But I, when I if we were using it at Ad Hammer and Chisel, and I was like, wow, this would be so great if it was like really gaming centric and had voice chat. Um, then Slack came out. Uh, it was a little bit demoting because a very polished product that I highly respect. Yeah. Um, so and yeah. Okay, but it wasn't it wasn't close enough for you to. Sort of it, it's it's a different like it's yeah. like you win by like really hyper um, like delivering for a specific customer and, and Slack is really focused on like the or the work or the workspace and we're really focused on like the unique needs of people who play games and there's things that Discord does people really weird and people are like why are you doing this and like well here's the reason that makes sense for people who play games and like you can only do that if you really focus and win over a specific customer and so then it was like many years of coding for you. <laughs> yeah. Um, when did you start, when did you as a team realize, okay, Discord truly is pro finding product market fit? Oh, um, so I, I, it depends, like you can always like find product market fit at like earlier stages, but like, the, can you get to the next stage, like yeah. across the chasm uh, thing? Um, I mean, when we were building it, we did the, the usual thing of like, can we get our friends to use it? Yeah. And that was the first milestone, because like, yeah. it was hard. They kept, they, our friends kept churning, and then we, um, once we got them to use it uh, through like iterating on feedback for them, we got like, like extended people to use it, like people that I knew from my like gaming career. Um, and then really, when it re really felt like it hit product market fit, is like when we did this Reddit post, and we kind of. Got, got people to try it on mass, and from that it was, it was like I think it was in May 2015. And that point, like, like we would talk to people, they would try it out, and then they would go and use it with their friends. And every day after that, the chart went up and to the right, and like organically. Like we of course learned to how to fuel it and all this other stuff, but like people were spreading it. They, they right. knew they loved it, and like, it was just like how do you just throw more fuel on this fire? <laughs> right. So. So what's pretty amazing is that actually that Reddit post mm -hmm. was the marketing budget. Yeah, I mean that's really what started it. Like it, before the post, it was like, does anyone care? Like we we got our friends to use it, but how do we actually promote this? And it was very like grassroots. Like I actually I posted the uh, I had a friend post the post. Uh, it's like oh has anyone tried this? Right. And then I, no one actually cared actually. So I I dropped a Discord link. I was like what if they click on it and they get on voice chat and they hear me in a browser? Because back then that was kind of novel still. And like, oh, I'm, I make this. And then Jason joined. And then that was the marketing thing. And that actually seeded how we built our marketing as well as our customer experience. Like, our whole strategy became around super fans. How do we create super fans? Because if we can like, touch people and delight them and like, show them that we care, they will go tell their friends. And that's like the most scalable marketing. So, yeah. I mean, uh, what's always been so cool about working with you folks is the things that you intuitively do yeah. turn out to be the things that you know, most companies, through a lot of analysis, realize that they need to do. So like the Reddit post and then, wait, how do we make it magical once you land on this yeah. novel thing? Yeah. Um, my next question would be, what, what demonstrated super fan value? Like, was it the number of hours or the number of friends that they brought? Um, so, you, yeah. Yeah, you had yeah, earlier. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then I'll talk yeah. about like, how Index decided to invest. Okay, okay. Um, so for that one, I think early on, before we had our own fancy and analytic systems that we ended up building, uh, we were using Mixpanel at the time, and one metric we would just log is how many p people, uh, for each user we had in, the, in, in our analytics, how many invites generated registration for those users. And we'd basically just like track, like, were we generating more users that were like virally adding more users? We, we internally we used to call them super nodes, like, yeah. because like if we get someone who's like a tastemaker to like invite a group or two groups, those groups eventually invite more groups. So you get this kind of spread factor. So right. So right. But that wasn't a natural to you because you guys were game developers rather than studying yeah. sort of social networks or viral. You know, like how to how to acquire customers on a viral or users on a viral basis on a viral loop. Yeah, but like luckily, like when we were starting out at this point, like there's been a lot of social products that have gone, right. and, you just kind of, and then luckily in the, in this industry, just this, like this event, people kind of share how right. they get shit right. and stuff right. done, right? And that's actually the remarkable part. And as long as you go out there and look, and even reach out and talk to people, even at competitive competitive companies, 
they'll talk to you about yeah. it. They'll help you, and it's kind of awesome. Had you hired at this stage anyone who had worked for Facebook or for you know like some of the some of the more social communi Skype communication apps? No, I think at this point no. we didn't have yeah. anyone. I mean, I mean some of us the... worked on like social mobile games, and right. they have very similar dynamics, especially right. the multiplayer ones. Like, yeah. like uh, it's, the cost of acquisition is always high, so how do you get it down to uh, something? Yeah. Like, and usually, like the social dynamics are the best way to do that. So, cool. um, one of the, I mean, Discord for us, mm -hmm. we met you guys around that time uh, that you're talking about, 2016. Yeah. So we didn't invest in the first, <laughs> uh, the, in the first iteration, but had been trying to get in front of you guys, and you know, no surprise that none of the VCs wanted to make any intro. <laughs> so finally got uh, one, of our, uh, one of our entrepreneurs who had, who had built Playfish to make yeah. the intro, and that's how we got to see you. And I remember um, meeting you, but sitting down with Jason, and the first, it was supposed to be a 15-minute coffee, yeah. and it ended up being a 90-minute conversation, actually it was an inquisition by him, <laughs> it, making me explain why th basically one of the worst investments I ever made, Nasty Gal, was a disaster. Yeah. And at every point he was asking, so what did you do then? And how did you end up with the team? And how did you, how did, did you stay in the game or did you guys, yeah. and it was, it was quite uncomfortable, <laughs> but he agreed the following day to have dinner with us, and he presented two slides. And the two slides were around uh, your cohort retention yeah. and the amount of time that folks were spending yeah. on the platform. And those two slides basically made us invest in one of the largest rounds we ever invested in because we had literally never seen uh, numbers like that. The, the level of what you're calling super fans, but like the level of commitment, loyalty, and the way that Discord was being viewed as a core part of people's lives was unprecedented yeah. from our perspective. Yeah. Okay, so then we invested and, uh, and things were going well. And then uh, you continued to grow, and then you raised a lot more money <laughs> um, on the basis of another idea that you folks had on how to take advantage of the fact that Discord was growing so well, and you had so many natural gamers on the platform. Can you walk us through that part? Yeah, I mean, it was kind of seeded in almost the beginning of the company, even from the game of like, yeah. once you have these people who really love your product and spend all this time on it, like, you can help them with the other experiences they want to have, to discover games, buy more games. So that was like our whole thing, like, we could, we could do this. So uh, around like, I think 20, the beginning of 2018, we're like, we think we're large enough where we can like compete with the incumbents. Let's do this. And we took the whole company, we're like, this is the year. and we built everything from the game SDKs to the store to, that was actually the first time I came to, uh, to, uh, to Helsinki because I was meeting all the game developers here that are super awesome, just to get them to like come to our, our store. And we, we worked so hard on this. We like the whole company, like this is what we've been building towards for many years. And, Which was a Steam alternative, basically. It was effectively a Steam alternative. Yeah. Like we we, we believe like like maybe hu um, with some hubris that we like we build great products and we can build a better game store and we can help people discover things in this in the social network that we have. Um, but in, in retrospect, we didn't have the 10x product that we did with the, with, the, with Discord itself. And when we ultimately launched the store, it just it didn't work. Almost in days, we were like, yeah, this is not going to work. And it, it was also the like, you know, everything is timing. And this is also the year that Fortnite blew up. Yeah. And, and Epic had all this money to also launch a game store. And we were like, well, that, that, that's, like, not great. Now that's not, we're not just competing. With, we're trying to compete with Steam. We're also trying to compete with, uh, with right. Epic. And we kind of had to step back and be like, like, is this really where we want to keep digging? Like, and like, that's something I think is the proudest moment, in, I think, in the company, like, internally viewed as, like, most companies would have just grinded for another year. <laughs> and yeah. we were like this is not something we can continue. Like, let's step back, let's think for first principles. What is our home turf? How do we win? And this is also where we had this reflection of like, people like really love Discord. And we had this subscription product on the side that we built called Nitro, which is a more premium Discord, which is like cosmetics and stuff. And it was doing pretty well. I'm like, what if we just kind of doubled down on that? 
and it was kind of crazy. <laughs> uh, we had to convince everyone that was a good idea, but it's totally worked out for us. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there are so many lessons there. I mean, the first is, you know, I, I remember the development path to build the Steam alternative yeah. literally did happen in a year. Yeah. And I was blown away yeah. by how much you delivered within yeah. a year. Yeah. And we should talk about that because that was just incredible execution. Yeah. Yeah. And then you raised all this money to go after it. And the premise of the money raising was to go after it. Yeah. And just after a few months, as you mentioned, yeah. you folks took the tough decision of yeah. like, no, we're actually not going to do this, which 99% of the companies out there and entrepreneurs would have said like, well, we raised the money on this basis, we have to follow through. Yeah. Um, but, and, and it was a lot of money, and it's not like you couldn't have... <coughs> <coughs> Sorry, that's embarrassing. <laughs> it's all good. You couldn't have um, carried on for at least a little while. Yeah. You had the money to do it. But you folks decided to call the VCs, to call the investors, say, we're not going down this path. We still want your money because we, we're pivoting again and we're going after something else, which, which actually made us feel as investors that you were phenomenal stewards yeah. of our investment because you were acting as it was your money, yeah. not, not investor money coming in. And you've always acted that way, which is so appreciated. And I do remember that Nitro was really, it was almost like you guys were shocked at how many people yeah. were using Nitro, yeah. and then you decided, actually, we should totally commit to that. So anyway, those were, those were my, uh, those my, my memories. But I did want to talk about how you've been able to just create this environment of crisis in order to get results on a, in a very short period of time, like very important development, product development, in a very short year, period of time. How do you build that into the, to the development and engineering culture of the company? Yeah, so, so there's a couple things go, that, that go in, into this stuff. I will say part of it does come from Jason, like the game store built in the, the game SDK and everything, the Steam computer built in a year. I remember we, January 2018, he's like, we're shipping this by August. I'm like, what? <laughs> like, even I thought it was kind of insane. But like from the very beginning, we, we had this mantra of small and mighty teams. Like let's, let's really hire slowly, intentionally, and just really people who are here for the right reasons, but also like it's better to have less people that are like really good than like a lot of people and and if people are also here for the right reason they'll like uh, you'll get like a multiplicative output from them just because they're super passionate so like we like and at the same time we've been very i'm going to say lucky with the technology choices we've made uh, that kind of allow us to move quickly as well like uh, like we, we don't have to build on multiple platforms because we reuse a lot of code. We have a lot of systems to test and get stuff into, pr into production super quickly. Um, and we're just not afraid to take risks. Like, for example, I'll, uh, the example I'll give for, the, for building the game SDK, like, we were a company full of, uh, like, honestly, front-end and back-end distributed systems <coughs> people. We had some people that knew C++ for our audio video tech, but they were really hard to hire. And the thing that game developers need in SDK is, like, it doesn't take any resources. And we're like, <laughs> well, we don't have enough C++ people to get this done in nine months. What if we took a risk and, um, on the language Rust? Because it seems like it would be much easier to learn for people who are not like, really deep in C++. And we just took that risk. And we had front-end engineers like, writing Rust. And they were just like, cool, I guess that's what we're doing now, which is very much a very different like, mentality. Like, that's what we hired for, like, do whatever it takes. So just learn new things. Don't be afraid. Really growth mindset. So. And how, because you're 900 people now, yeah. so like, how has it been to maintain that level of urgency and that level of quality as, as you've grown? I'm, I'm going to be honest, it's, it's been a lot harder, and especially happening during the pandemic. Like, yeah. right before the pandemic, I believe we had about 250 employees, yeah. and we're over 900 right now. Yeah. And, like, higher, we our service exploded and we didn't want people overworking that wasn't fair to them so we like immediately went into hire mode um but like many companies made the same mistake even though we said we wouldn't of um 
really not checking our hires over time and like not doing the due diligence of like was a successful hire. And we kind of slowed down. We kind of lost a lot of that edge. And uh, about a year ago, we, we kind of kind of went back to the team and said, look, this is not like what we originally set out to do. This is actually our expectations. We reset them all. And actually t told people, like, if this is not for you, like, it's OK. <laughs> like, that is totally OK. And just made that people's choice. But like, like and since then, the velocity has increased quite a bit. But we've also also flattened the company a little bit. Yeah. We, we were we were scaling for the next version when we didn't really need to. Um, so cool. stepping back and like thinking through, like, what do we actually need? What is most important? Right. So, uh, um, just to change the topic a bit, it's, also, it's, it's been interesting to see how Discord is so culturally relevant for a lot of new themes, like yeah. Web3, so much of it, so much of that discourse or conversation yeah. was happening on Discord. Yeah. And now with AI and mid-journey, why do you think that's the case? Like, why, <laughs> why is Discord so relevant yeah. for, those, for those, new in, those like new cultural movements? Yeah, it's it's. I was like, it's it's a very interesting thing. Like, if you step back to like what we built, like we we built for people who play games online with people. Yeah. And like, what well, there's certain things that they needed. They needed um, pseudonymity when you're playing with people online. You usually have a different identity, but it also is a way to keep yourself feel safer and more comfortable. You needed tools to control like who's in your allowed in your spaces. Um, and you needed it to like work like in a web browser, be super accessible. And there's a couple other things. If you really kind of step back, like, well, like that's very similar to like organizing online to do something like collaborate on like a Web three project or or play uh, or collaborate on like a new uh, like AI model or playing with Midjourney, and actually like we didn't really realize we were doing this when we were building Discord. Um, and the other part was we made our platform extensible because people who play yeah. games typically yeah. need very specific needs for their gaming groups, and they usually have someone that knows to code in their group. So we, Discord is extensible. So like if you take all that. It's like the perfect, it's like the same need. <laughs> and the other thing is that a lot of the people that love these things and spring up, guess what they do in their spare time? They play games. Right. And what we found with our users overall right. is they play games on Discord, but they love other things. Right. And they just kind of take Discord to those things. So Discord, like if, where else online can you really get to a place with a couple hundred people and talk in real time? Like just in a moment, like in real time chat and really have a conversation. I remember when I was, um, Back before the world of Discord, I would get on IRC to ask a programming question, and like people would reply like a day later, like it was not great. But because people are always on Discord, and you ask a question in one of these communities, right. there's always someone to reply. It's kind of magical, yeah. and sometimes you can even find like the person who created the thing. Um, so, so I waited for Times Up to make sure that it's a short question, a short <laughs> answer, because this could last a long time. But I would love to get your sense of AI and games and, and how you think about that. Like, how, how important is that going to be in, in game creation? Oh, I, I, I'm super excited about this. Like, I, I've met with a bunch of people who are already working on this. Like, the, the velocity for concepting and, like, create, uh, like, creating a lot more content, creating a dynamic content is just going to be it's really going to create experiences like we've never seen before. And like first, you'll see it, and you're already seeing it with like how do we concept faster, like uh, and then turn it into models. How do we get to, into playtests and playing stuff? And then it will probably turn into fully dynamic worlds. Uh, there, are, some of them are a little cringe right now, but it, like, if you think about it, it's the worst it's ever going to be at this very moment. Nice. And it's already impressive. <laughs> so awesome, great way to end. Yeah. Thank you so much, Stan, no, for thank making you for having the trip you. and for sharing all this with us. No problem. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Mm -hmm. That was awesome.